How can we ultimately live more attuned and in alignment with our our natural environment around us? And you know, and I say that it doesn't mean you have to be this idea that you have to be out in nature. I mean, the fact that we're living, breathing on planet Earth means we are <laughs> in a natural system, even if we're in a what seems like a concrete jungle in a city. I also think people are really recognizing that there, at some level, there's this mirroring going on. If you, you know, our human health is at crisis point, um, isn't that reflective also of the state of the health of our environment? Um, because the two things are completely interlinked. You're listening to the Spaceship Earth podcast with me, Dan Burgess. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. Um, this is episode 15. Um, this is a conversation uh, I had um, a few weeks ago in Dublin, in Ireland, um, with the remarkable Eastie Britain. Uh, now, if you've listened to uh, uh, some of my episodes, well, you might well you might have listened. Actually, episode two of the Spaceship Earth was with Eastie Britain, so it's the first time I've had uh, another conversation with a guest, which is uh, which was kind of a milestone for me, which is great. Um, now, if you know the um, uh, the surfing world and the big big wave world, you may well have come across Eastie uh, Eastie Britain in the past. Um, Eski is one of those characters who's just uh, she has multiple strings to her bow. She's she's very active across a, a range of different bl- bl- disciplines. She's um, I guess a pluralist, which is what's so fascinating I think about about Eski. But you know she's a big wave surfer, professional surfer. She's a social activist. Uh, she's an artist. She's a researcher, an academic. Um, she's sort of prolific in lots of different areas. And there's a thread that runs through all of her work, and that is the ocean and water more broadly, and our connection to that. Um, and I love spending time with Eski because uh, you always, not only does she have this extraordinary sort of energy to her uh, and way of sort of looking at the world and, um, you know, thinking about her place in the world and others' place. Um, she is just full of uh, of interesting things that are going on, whether they be um, her work projects, whether it's experiments that she's looking at, whether they're creative, more arty experiments, whether they're experiments she's looking at through her connection to surfing and water, uh, whether it's more on the research side of things. There's always uh, there's always something um, pretty interesting going on. So it's a real pleasure to hang out with Eski. And um, at the end of this session in, in Dublin, which was a two-day uh, workshop, um, which was kind of exploring um, ocean health and human health, which I was really delighted and privileged to be a part of, um, we had managed to catch up. We had sort of like literally an hour in the morning before the end of this, at the end of this whole two-day session to have a quick conversation. So this is... This is a quick, spontaneous conversation, and um, it picks up a little bit where uh, we left off uh, last time round, which is really starting, to really exploring again the kind of um, these kind of connections to the health of the human and the health of the ocean and the water more broadly, and our connection to that, and uh, maybe our disconnection to that, and I, I guess exploring uh, some of this work that uh, that Eski is very active in, and um, I've been exploring in my own way as well. So. Hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation. Uh, it was early, in, it was quite early, it was sort of just off the breakfast and uh, um, yeah, it was fun to do and I uh, uh, recommend if you haven't checked out Eski's work, do so. Um, it's super interesting what she's up to and uh, I'll link to uh, that in the show notes and we chat about some of her uh, uh, sort of more active projects in, in the show itself. So um, yeah, uh, episode 15 with uh, Spaceship Earth podcast with Eski Britain. Enjoy. Eski, I can actually say welcome back to the Spaceship Earth oh. podcast. You're the first guest <laughs> I've said that to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. And we're in, um, we're in Dublin. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not. It's quite exciting. We are close to the sea, though, which is a we bonus. are. Well, you yeah. just you've just got out of the sea. Yeah, I yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I mean, how are you, how are you today? How are you feeling? I'm good. Um, yeah, I got up first thing this morning to jump in the sea because I'm I'm not often on the east coast mm. and there's not much surf. <laughs> yeah, but I still feel like I need to get my sea fix. Um, and also, when I go somewhere new, I really like to experience and explore what the coast is like mm. and what people are doing around it. And I always think like there's some amazing swim spots, especially on the side of the country. And so, just keen to see like what what's what's happening. Um, and what was happening at half past and it, seven? Well, the other thing, half seven is great because you get the sunrise and you can be in the water watching the sunrise, which over the sea. So if I'm on the West Coast, that never really happens. 
So that that kind of was felt a bit trippy. And it was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. I also checked the weather forecast and knew it was going to be socked in and raining probably for the rest of the day. So there was this little window of amazing kind of cloud colors and hmm. yeah, the sun rising. And I thought I'd have a nice like kind of solo swim. Um, but not at all. <laughs> the place is like, packed. It's a real kind of. It was interesting. People were just kind of quietly coming, undressing, getting into the water, swimming around, and then slipping back out and dispersing back into whatever everyone does in their day. Mm. But there was just that little moment where it's all it's shared. Mm. Um, it felt really lovely. You know, you can s- sort of anonymously rock up somewhere and feel like you belong for at least a few moments. Yeah, it's cool. That's quite. So, and did, it, did you get a sense that because it's hard to tell, you're just doing your thing, but it's, that this is something that people are doing? Yeah, habitually. definitely felt like regulars, and you sort yeah. of probably noticed, like, hmm, who's this one? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, like a dedicated crew, but all ages, shapes, sizes, everything. It was. Uh, that's what I love about it. Mm. Um, and were people wet suited up or was it just... No, no, not at all. And you could tell the ones who were really kind of committed regular swimmers and they had the be in their togs but then have um, like wetsuit gloves. Um, so obviously they know what their bodies and it takes longer for their hands to warm up or something. But I love those kind of little adaptations yeah, people yeah. have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, no wetsuits at all. Yeah. And because I, I mean, you know, you, you obviously see this a lot more because you're often in on by the water. But I get a real sense that m- more people are sort of looking to the water again, I, or, or especially cold water. It's just, it feels like there's something. Maybe that's just in, you know, my world and the streams of feeds of people I see. But it yeah. doesn't. Yes, get a sense that maybe there's something. Or, or, or more than usual, people maybe are, are looking towards to water again, or not? Yeah, maybe I don't know. What do you do? You, make, do you see that or sense that? Or? I, I feel like that too. I do question it because I think maybe I'm just completely in my own bubble. And <laughs> uh, but then I have been I've been connected with the the sea and water my whole life, and I've definitely gone through large periods where I felt like a total outlier. Um, you know, all through my childhood, there just wasn't anyone surfing year round the beaches would be empty um everyone thought I was crazy they still do a bit but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Can't imagine why. and it just but you know anyone who went into the sea was was mad and now people go into the sea and it's it's definitely seems to have become more of a norm mm. um, and there is something to the cold water that was always seen as a barrier in Ireland um and actually there's a shift happening there and people understanding actually the benefits from it. Yeah. Um, when you sort of learn how to, I suppose, build up that resilience in your body and the benefits are, are huge. So, mm. uh, and there has been people have been doing it always, um, but there just seemed to be more of a, yeah, a movement happening. Yeah. And I don't know, is it also because of the, well, the work I'm doing, I'm seeing it more, mm. um, but also then with social media and you can, those trends when they flare up you can spot them so like the rise fierce one yeah people jumping in the morning for yeah. their swims and those kinds of things but it also helps build community um so i think that's a really interesting part of it too yeah definitely um i think the cold water thing and i'm i sort of i am seeing sort of you know even just people talking about more about cold showers and obviously plunging into the ocean if they live near or they have access but people seem to be taking to rivers again even the even you know rivers in in the in the in winter it just feels like that's the sort of the the medicine potential of water is seems to be sort of i don't know pulling people a little bit i mean it seems like a, i would love love to see i mean it's, that's that's a great thing i think but it's uh, it's just interesting i'm trying to think like, mm. what is it that's driving what is it maybe that's that's pulling more people towards looking at things like cold water as as more than just you know, as not just a fearful thing, which is a, or a sort of a, a, an uncomfortable thing, but seeing that there's there's something in that. Yeah, and I I want yeah. What are the factors that are leading to this mm. um, almost um, revival of it again? Mm. And um, I'm curious about it too. I think in well, for going back to I suppose with with Ireland, a few things have maybe changed and. I mean, wet, wetsuits have been one that have made it a lot more accessible to just mm. get in the sea. And so there's water sports have kind of grown. And then you had, you know, just a few years ago with the launch of something like the Wild Atlantic Way, put the impact of the sea and how it influences and shapes our coastline mm. back in everyone's consciousness. And also that people then thought, oh, I can actually have these experiences in, in my own backyard right. along my own coast. Right. And, 
And then maybe it's also the stories and storytelling aspect too. So there's a, been a lot of people, I suppose, writing more about that experience and relationship and the impact. Um, but I think the most profound impact that seems to be coming out is the more emotional, mental, psychological. Mm. And then there's also the, all these phys- you know, physical benefits too that amplify how we feel and our mood. And um, so I think it's a real combination of things, but it's exciting because walking along here, uh, we're in Dunleary, there's construction going on along the prom, but what they're, I took a you know, stop to take a look and what they're actually doing is re- redeveloping it to put in um, baths again. So these sea baths, nice. um, which, is, nice. which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So there is that sort of reconnecting, reclaiming and a change in how we value um, our coastal spaces. Yeah. Um, and with it, there's more awareness too and perhaps pressure on, you know, to have better water quality and yeah. those things when you're really immersed in it. So that's the the upside of that as well yeah um or the downside at the moment because we still <laughs> don't have great water quality everywhere but it that's also yeah. becoming more of an issue on the agenda once more people are in these spaces yeah um, yeah it's important there's there's something so i've been i've been just been doing this experiment for a lot probably since just before the end of last year but um which I, again and i heard s- someone talking about this and i, I know the obviously the cold water impact but i've just been doing a like a in a shower just the last yeah. whacking the last minute to freezing um and it's actually been a super interesting experiment and I'm, i sort of feel now that i'm it's now a habit that i'm quite you know it's it's becoming um instinctive i'm just you know i'm not even having to think about it i've got through the kind of like the jumping up screaming in the shower <laughs> bit the first couple of, now now it's, it feels great and i'm sort of really feeling that there's something in that that's actually um, yeah, it's beneficial to me. It's 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 a, it's a felt thing, but it feels like it's having impacts which are worthwhile. So, um, but I, but I'm curious about that generally. In sort mm. of when I look sort of wider, it feels like sort of modern modern Western humans have become very comfortable, or, met, or at least uh, you know those of us yeah. who've had privilege to access homes and comfort and whatever have got have you know you you expect hot water, <clears throat> you expect these kind of things, but actually. It's interesting, isn't it? And therefore, cold mm. water has sort of become this kind of like, oh, it's only you know, it's, it's a it's a bad thing, you know. But actually, <laughs> maybe maybe it's actually a really good thing for us. It's strange, you know. Yeah, I think <laughs> isn't that interesting? It's part of the what you're saying is almost the yeah, it, it, it's related to this disconnect, isn't it? How mm. we've become so comfortable that it's led to an almost like numbing, especially when it comes to how our body experiences sensations. Mm. Um, so we kind of really like, you know, physically separate ourselves where, you know, we never go barefoot anywhere. We're always, you know, fully rugged up when we go outside or, yeah. um, and this, that's amazing with the cold shower thing because it's when you initially do it, it just feels so terrible <laughs> 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 yeah. and really uncomfortable, but you actually just take a moment to really sink into your body and feel what you feel um it's incredible when you start to just focus on that sensations and you realize it's your whole body waking up um we have something like i think three times more maybe even more than that cold water receptors on our skin and um so this having the cold shower acts as this mini workout and mm. boosts your metabolism and yeah so i'm always telling people you know you get like one minute cold water in the shower it's like you know beats having to <laughs> go on the treadmill in the yeah gym right and, um and even saves energy because you're not using hot water um <laughs> yeah 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 exactly 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 <laughs> flip your sort of poverty to a really good uh, 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 uh but there is, there is something about that of this we've kind of yeah um that that need to be able to feel again mm. um and i think that's why water is so powerful um when we especially we don't even have to immerse ourselves in it but that when we do then it's it's really fires all the cells in our body are, mm. are waking up then and so when we last chatted which was early last year um we we were talking about your your work your deepening work in um human health and ocean health and connection mm-hmm. to water and um and obviously out here in dublin you know i've come out as part with uh, as part of a, a group of different folks who've come to to explore some of this with you out here can you tell us a bit about this work uh, particularly mm. for those uh, listening in to like um yeah because it's been a really interesting uh experience being here for a part of it but can you tell about yeah this the, the work you're doing now in this space because it's it's really deepening now isn't it 
Huge. Yeah, so why, how we've ended up here is uh, because of a project called SOFI, which stands for Seas, Oceans and Public Health in Europe. Um, I've got a strange image of someone in my head when Sophie... The sea got yeah. Yeah, um, which is, it's an EU-funded Horizon 2020 project, that, er, and it runs until June mm-hmm. um, 2020. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I work at Galway University, NUI Galway, um, with two colleagues of mine who are experts in like behavioral change and social marketing. Mm. Um, and we do a lot of stakeholder engagement work. So our part in the project is to open up the space to have these conversations around how people understand um, or how do you even create understanding of that link between the value of the ocean, seas and coasts for human health? Mm. And then in the context of Europe, with the ultimate aim overall of the project to influence uh, and create a st- or recommend, I suppose, a strategic research agenda. So how do you actually uh, move move this up the agenda and, and then get those different, I suppose, sectors and disciplines speaking with each other yeah. and looking at how we how we might create that link and value between how the sea impacts our health, um, you know, both positively and negatively and vice versa. So yeah, <laughs> right. the consequences of, um, I suppose, hu- our human impact on the sea and yeah. what that then ultimately means for our own well-being. Um, so I'm excited about looking at it because it creates that connection again and we can't sort of isolate or separate all the parts. Yeah. Um, and that's what interests me. It sort of is about how you embrace that complexity, um, which can scare policymakers. But sure. We're, we're working on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so this last, like yesterday, we had the workshop where we had this amazing gathering of really kind of, um, I was going to say ocean minded um, folks, but there was a real broad spectrum. Yeah, right. So, you know, people who are already making that link in their work between the ocean and health. Um, but everything from, you know, tourism and academia to activism. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it was super diverse. <laughs> yeah, to sort of unpack, okay, what are, what, what do we want to prioritize when, when we're looking at this? What, what matters most? Um, and, and how do we create the necessary steps to take action on that? Yeah. That's ultimately the most important. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, I mean, from, from my perspective, from, um, I mean, I don't want to talk about Brexit, but when think think about that kind of like the, the sort of e, sometimes the, the the story of the EU sometimes right now, but to see a project like this, which is exploring you know the links between human health and ocean health and coastlines and water more broadly and blue space, I mean, that's like f- yeah, I mean it's super progressive and great. Well, you know, it, it shouldn't be progressive, but it's it probably is seen, but it's it's really amazing to see that work that's happening you know, on something which feels um, really needed, really, and the sort of opportunity of breakthroughs with that kind of work, or, you know, if you, when you sort of, s- I was sitting there at times just say thinking, where's this gonna, you know, where, how might this work play out in the world eventually, you know, and, and it, and, you know, I think as we actually moved in a little bit into some of the solution spaces in the mm. afternoon, you could start to see how, you know, how, thinking of how you, sorts of interventions that could sort of accelerate this kind of, um, these practices, these these uh, these ways of thinking about human health, environmental health, connected to the water. You think, yeah, I mean that that only feels like a really good thing right <laughs> now, you know. Um, yeah. Particularly with all the, I mean, just even stepping away from the from the sort of the ocean and waterways and coastal health itself, and the problems obviously that that whole all those ecosystems have but even just from, from the human health perspective we're in such a crisis of of human health in in our sort of highly developed world you know so seeing seeing work like this just feels really important as a, another dimension to more conventional ways of thinking about healthcare. um mm. and ha- so how's that are you finding that in this work is that is are people receptive gen- really receptive or is there yeah there's still question marks to um yeah i think there's a real curiosity because you know there's a, either an immediate yes um mm. i'm in mm. or i think it's it's a bit harder to make the link in trying to communicate the relevance of the marine environment in a you know public health context or to get that how do you get that across to yeah that that world and maybe it's partly a language thing as well um but um 
I, I think there even there there's this real interest and curiosity and it builds on the the links that are being created between obviously the the impact on health when it comes to climate change mm. and the recent lancet report on that and um and then this even shift in how we think about our health and things like planetary health and yeah um i also think people are really recognizing that there at some level there's this mirroring going on if you, you know, our human health is a crisis point um isn't that reflective also of the state of the health of our environment yeah um because the two things are completely interlinked mm. um and it's how you yeah how you communicate i suppose the importance yeah. um and relevance of that for yeah. how we look at both when it comes to um restoring regenerating protecting the environment but also when it comes to our health care they they're so intertwined yeah um, yeah but that's but you know that's because i'm you know also sort of hearing and sensing that there's more of this conversation happening now the more of this kind of looking at sort of you know this planet we live on that's all around us that we're part of and the you know the destruction and the the impacts that we're seeing environmentally and obviously this kind of increasing breakdown in human health whether it's chronic stress related illness and disease mental health particularly anxieties depressions mm -hmm. and all the physical things and it feels i think if you're sort of you know if you're if you have a for whatever reason have a a deeper connection to the the non-human world you've probably been sensing this and seeing this as quite evident but you know i know that if even if even probably a not that long ago i've thrown that idea into a discussion with you know folks around who maybe aren't sort of you know are seeing more the world as a as a, a nature as a resource you know seeing the world more as a sort of you know industrial kind of thing the idea that we can you know that the planetary health is connected to our health you know they were they would probably you know look at me quite strangely well i've had that <laughs> so I'm like yeah, whatever. <laughs> Weird guy in the corner. Um, but uh, <laughs> but this, this is, you know, the, uh, clearly it's shifting. But I'm just, I'm just, um, it's it's such an interesting time, isn't it? Because because with the current the current way things are sort of going, um, I guess I'm always interested in how some of these ideas that seem to be more on the edges, what is it that suddenly brings them more into the, you know, so they become more accessible, I guess. Or they make sense to more people. Um, are you seeing yeah. signs of that in your work, with particularly with water and human health? And yeah, I'm, I to think think of a few. I mean, there's so many examples. Mm. Um, well, one for like I'll draw upon, I suppose, surfing, which is the <laughs> where I'm, yeah, where of I'm course. most at home and most familiar with. But in in the research I've been doing in Galway on another project called Near Health, it's been looking at, I suppose, more how people value access and and engage with nature in their sort of more nearby local environments. Mm. So the more at that grassroots community level. Um and then what what's blocking or what are the barriers for people to engage. And when I say people, I guess a really broad spectrum. Um, but within that we've also been looking at the therapeutic and health promoting benefits. And one example would be surf therapy. Mm. Um, and there there's an interesting trend happening, I suppose globally. Uh, there's in several organizations that have been operating for, for quite a while um, using it in a therapeutic setting either for people recovering you know with with symptoms of like PTSD yeah. or kids with autism or um, um, really diverse mix and they've created the International Surf Therapy Organization in 2017 ISTO and there it was I suppose recognizing again that this was in growing Im importance and seeing the impact um, but it just being really disparate so they were all doing their own thing in different parts of the world so how do you collectively come together and build on that a the knowledge base yes. share what works what doesn't um, of course our relationship with the sea and environment I think is very culturally um embedded as well mm. and so it's different in in each country maybe mm. the same program you can't translate everywhere so but also recognizing the need from their point of view when it comes to trying to have a voice and be seen um to be um what's the word i suppose legitimate like how do you stand up in a room in front of right you know 
um, healthcare practitioners who are basing the treatments they're going to give their patients right. on these clinical trials right. from pharmaceutical companies right. and uh, with you know uh, really huge evidence base and you can do these randomized controlled trials because you're in a controlled environment. Yeah, right, right. And you've got uh, the funds and yeah. So they're also looking at that. That then um, like the challenges and and how do you address the need to I suppose from their point of view capture um, and measure some of this impact so you can try to. I suppose that set that agenda for the value of it. Um, yeah, and it's interesting times. And then I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about. I like. I really see it's a very powerful, important link to make of how important it is for our health, mm. but the danger of reducing it to, uh, you know, uh, uh, here's a dose of nature. Here's a, here's a you know, like yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. putting nature in this. You know, almost like a yes. you know a vitamin supplement. Yes. <laughs> So I think any form of connection at this stage, I'm I'm all for it. But also as as it as it grows and develops, to hold that mm. I suppose awareness of its its value in and of itself, and yeah. take care probably not to reduce it. Yeah, to, uh, yeah. I think my what I'm seeing a lot in sort of in you know um, uh, the sort of modern, or at least in you know the modern humans' approach to health. You know, has been it sort of t- sort of tends to be sort of two ways of those I guess that are sort of starting to experiment with their own self awareness and understanding that you know their health is actually made up of a whole range of di- different dimensions um, and that there is no you know there's not one thing it's many but we but it feels like we're still very much in that space of looking for solutions often to health issues you know yeah. so. What's the tablet? What's the pill? What's the diagnosis? What's wrong with me? You know, versus, um, you know, taking a more, you know, I don't know use that word holistic, but it, taking a more, yeah, viewing your health more from a sort of system point of view, looking at everything you do from, you know, connection to, to the natural world will be one part of potentially for some people, if it works for them, but of several different, mm, you know, yeah. practices, I guess, from, yeah. from, proper sleep i mean sleep's the classic one how much more we understanding about how damaging lack of sleep is and actually how many people aren't sleeping properly because of all kinds of reasons stress anxiety too much watching stuff too late screens eating bad food whatever it might be Mm. but it's interesting i think in this moment like you say not looking again to sort of you know the sort of natural world becoming the answer it's part of a whole kind of potentially a whole sort of way of thinking about your health sort of differently. Do you know what I mean? Totally. And one one way I might think of that, it's almost like, a, well, there's the holistic sense, but it's like also taking a, a more sideways step, like maybe not tackling it head on. And mm. by that, I mean, it comes to say that at, in terms of health, I'm thinking of the like swimming groups in Galway who have also worked with. Um, and there's this amazing kind of swim program called Ebb and Flow run by two sisters, Sarah and Katrina Lynch. Uh-huh. Um, they have their own swim company called Swim Buddies. Uh, but they recognized, I suppose, that the challenge and, and all the sort of different barriers and fears of making that transition from a contained, say, pool environment that you may be in as a as a kid or now yeah. as an adult into into the sea. And so in Big, Galway, yeah. there's that amazing prom at Salt Hill and uh, a brilliant bay for swimming in. But if you weren't, I guess... In a way, if you didn't have the opportunity of being like born into it yeah. or having that sea connection, yeah. um, it's a really intimidating it's a big space. Barrier. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it's and yet they their whole lives have revolved around it, like mine with surfing, and they really can see the impact it can have, the potential in terms of healing. Yeah. Um, and just that connection with, with the environment and nature yeah. every day. And probably um, others, I guess, as well. There's a community yeah, connection and as it's, well that and go. It's also just there on your doorstep and yeah. it, it's accessible. And also, when it, I suppose, when it, especially when it comes to swimming, like you actually don't need anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you do need some support and tools to be able to take yeah. that step into a totally unknown alien environment. And they've done this beautifully of this, basically this lovely transitioning they facilitate that transition from our sort of man-made controlled world, which is a lovely kind of metaphor, almost like the the, the indoor swimming pool, yeah. to the, <laughs> this outdoor, you know, untamable, unpredictable, ever-changing environment um, that we immerse ourselves in. And all of a sudden, it's like that. In, in a way, it's separate. It's funny you're talking about connection, but, but, if it's mm. separate, <laughs> yeah. but it separates <clears throat> us from 
the almost when I see people take part in it and you kind of you're taking your clothes off mm. and everyone puts on like maybe their swimsuits or wetsuits and it's like we've we were able to leave behind the, all those roles we have to play on on the mm. daily and then as soon as people get in the water there's this change that happens but what they do they also recognize that it's it can be really overwhelming mm. so how do you prepare the body and the mind and they focus a lot on breathing and body movement and then also then how do you begin to understand and learn about this environment so that ultimately you have the skills and tools to be able to read it and know what the you know the wind will do when it blows a certain direction how that affects the current the different types of waves that you know the signs hmm. to read um so that you also build your confidence mm. and then i see this spill over into other aspects of of their lives right you know when you feel like you you come over overcome what's one of your greatest fears which is perhaps swimming out of your depth yeah um and then that completely affects you when you go back yeah. on land and or swimming in and, lakes and take over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, when I go and swim in a lake, it's like well, I did that. Yeah. Um, and so it shifts your mindset, and that stays with you. Mm. Um, so it isn't just about what happens, you know, when you're yeah. in the water. It's um, so interesting, is because when you think of when you think of um, you know a form of I use the word healing practice, let's call, rather than medicine, because I think that's more a, a, a form of, you know, um, a well-being practice or whatever we want to call it. But like what you've just talked about, because there's all these other things that you're, uh, you know, it's not just getting into some cold water, some wild water, you know, that you're not used to or is unfamiliar. Mm. But like you've, what you've just talked through, that whole process of... Um, there's some there's some there's some there's some mind work going on there's a lot of body work going on there's a lot of sort of feeling and sensing and emotional processing that you just don't get from popping a pill <laughs> do you know what i mean do you know what i mean no. though yeah. but, but cuz it gets yeah. again to like what is it that's really mm. causing mm. our pains and uncomfort you know what i mean and so yeah i think it's so interesting um this whole area and and how to make how can these kinds of um, practices become more accessible, which is what you're talking about, so that other others can find their way into this and, and trial this kind of stuff. Because I think that's, yeah. and again, and that's the same as, for me, it would be identical as, you know, um, you know, visiting the woods often or yeah. sitting with trees or, you know, uh, um, stillness in a space, or they're all different forms of, of you know, connection and letting go and all kinds of stuff which feel like yeah really um important practices for yeah for in the world right now <laughs> and i think about it, it's like where do we want to go with it all and i know that was that was coming up yesterday it's yeah. like well you know how do we want it to be what's it all for and and for me is it how can we ultimately live more attuned and in alignment with our our natural environment around us and you know, and I say that it doesn't mean you have to be this idea that you have to be out in nature. I yeah. mean, the fact that we're living, breathing on planet Earth means we are <laughs> in a natural system, yeah. even if we're in a what seems like a concrete jungle in a city. Yeah. Um, it, it's still on the, on this planet. Um, and so we're affected always by natural systems. Yeah. Um, and, it, and yeah, so it's even things like, you know, the importance of how do you communicate the value when it comes to like planning that there you have public spaces that have access right. to to water, to to the woods. Yeah, um, exactly. Like here what they're doing in, in Dunleary is is um is hugely important for so many reasons of career, you know, bringing back the that, you know, bathing space by the sea. Yeah. And, um and it and then it's looking at that on lots of different levels of, of trying to shift those stories of the sea too so that they're not all one narrative. Right. And um, for example, again, going back to surfing, uh, there's a, I think a real sort of shift and change there, in particular when it comes to gender equality in women in surfing. Um, it's that's very there's a very big push at the moment right now to get recognised, you know, with equal pay for men yeah. and women on the surf tour, that, and, yeah. um, and things like that. But it's just so that industry is so dominated by the narrative of this you know this one type of person who's a surfer which yeah. is typically like the, the white male yeah. heterosexual on a short board high performance <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. and it just doesn't represent anymore yeah. pe those people who who surf in the water and all around the world and so it's those things as well of trying to 
show how yeah, yeah there's meant that there's many sides and dimensions yeah i think there's loads of different ways of connecting yeah. with nature there's and there's loads of different ways of valuing and understanding it from different cultural perspectives so i think it's not shutting any of those down and but actually opening them up more yeah um and especially as our communities become more mixed and diverse and multicultural i think that's a really interesting sort of next space um to move into and in particular when it comes to to research and how we, we better understand that because it has been very dominated by um, our Western notion of what can nature do for us and, <laughs> mm, totally. and an assumption that it's, um, for example, with water and, and the sea, that it's it's all good. Um, when in fact there's, um, you know, there can be a lot of different barriers there for different, different people. So. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, yesterday, uh, it was really... Um, exciting to see the the blue spaces idea and thinking about how that you know experience of blue space and you know we got to not just on coastlines and but inland and in cities and how how can we increase how might that increase and how might access open up and you know what what's needed for those kind of breakthroughs to happen like you say whether it's through different ways of thinking about planning different ways of incentivizing communities all kinds of ways and that feels really interesting because I think that's the thing. It's again, I mean, some of the sort of breakthroughs I've had in the last couple of years is is just that realization of of how connected we are to the ocean, even when we're even when we're not close to it physically, you know. And so, how do you bring that connection into the into places which are, as you say, increasingly urban and um, harder for people to to feel that that connection? So those sort of blue spaces feel really interesting and how those mm. will develop over time what that would look like and and like you say how to bring in those in our communities who are less heard or seen yeah. um yeah where do, i mean is, is there, are there any examples you can see of that starting to happen where where um in this country i guess or in europe particularly where um there is more diversity coming around the sort of the future of, of 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 water in our in our lives and how those places will open up yeah um i i think it's it's been slow to change mm. <laughs> um but there have been small changes and i think in ireland in particular what a big success story is something like we have uh, this organization called irish water safety so they're in charge with well this water safety for the entire country but they <coughs> And with lifeguards and all of that. But they also have this amazing training program from like from when you're a kid all the way up um, with learning those skills of, of how to be be safe in water, but also to feel confident to it, it, what it is, is a form of ocean literacy. Right. Um, and so I, I grew up in, and had that um, kind of access to that. Um and they're increasingly recognizing as the importance of even things like for you know different able bodies so how do you like to be in the water is is so powerful for people with different types of disabilities um for injury um you know spinal cord injuries for example yeah. or um and anywhere i suppose on on land where you feel really really limited um and then when you're in the water there is that just incredible sense of um your your body is is weightless you're not being pulled down anymore mm. and and i know from research that's been done and that we've been doing the therapeutic benefit is that of that is tremendous it's almost feeling um that sense of wholeness again and that you're the same as everyone else in the water too yeah you aren't differentiated because of um because of your body for example for yeah that mo time that you're in the water it's a sort of leveler yeah in that way and so mm. then it's like looking at okay if that that has such value and impact when it comes to um recovery and uh, rehabilitation and restoring um how do you create greater wheelchair access for example and so having things like those um beach wheelchairs and yeah ramps in and then also then the the training so that anyone who's offering kind of you know water sports like surfing or swimming or it just is mainstreamed into that as part of your you know instructor yeah. training you you're able to provide for everyone yeah um, that stuff feels really important because again thinking about we're starting to do a little bit of with the wild apps work does starting to do a little bit of pl planning now for 
for the World Ocean Day for schools this mm. year and and thinking about, you know, you know, last year was much more about a sort of conversation really and this year we're thinking, you know, is it possible to get a bit more experience or to yeah. find ways and then I mean, obviously that, you know, the obvious thing is how, you know, how do you get kids close to water and in water? And of course, when you're not on coastlines, you're talking about, you know, rivers and streams and all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, you're opening up this whole health and safety sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, mm -hmm. and that's so that's tricky, right? Because that so the, that that's it, I think this is the thing, isn't it? When we're when we're particularly with um, with younger or those who are less confident or have fear of water or whatever, that kind of um, that transitioning, that helping uh, them gain that confidence, whether it's learning how to swim, whether it's just understanding, uh, you know, what to be aware of and what to look out for. That's sort of critical in order to help people often to make the connection. And so, but it's a, an area, I guess, again, it sort of seems like it's, it's very underfunded. It's hard for, mm. but that does feel like sort of there needs to be quite some quite, there's some good thinking and some solutions around how do you, you know what I mean? Almost people that yeah. can help the connection happen, if you like. Yeah, and it, it does take a few, like that's the other really important point is, is leadership, right? you know, at, at every level. So from the grassroots community all the way up into into like government and those champions that we were kind of talking yeah, about right. yesterday for yeah. it. And you do need that. Um, so one other example that comes to mind is... Um, this uh, amazing woman GP Sarah Harron and her partner um they recently lost their their baby girl last year um but they're she's passionate about the sea and surfing and I suppose for her it's where she goes and finds her kind of form of healing too and wanted to make that more accessible for other kids and they have two young boys and know how much they benefit from it and mm. they live in Cork um and we kind of just connected through Instagram these uh storytelling of our you know shared passion for the sea and at the same time I was thinking about how do you create more access to to more diverse groups and she had come up with this concept welcome wave hmm. as a way to engage um, kids in the local direct provision centers so these are children and families who are coming to seek asylum or refugees um, but they're in Ireland we have this terrible system called direct provision where they're kind of held in these in this limbo yeah. essentially for, for years sometimes uh, with no way to really connect with place or community or to find any sense of belonging and you've just uprooted from your very sense of who you are and your identity and home. And so through, in a really simple way, how might something like surfing help just create that sense of connection with the sea? You're living on a coast, you might never have seen a sea before or been in it before. And so they do offer this uh, surf program for right. for these kids in direct provision. And um, and it's amazing. One level is just really simple. Just go and go and surf and for did like a four week program and they're going to build on it again in the coming year and hopefully move it around different places. Um, but it's also a really important way of how we see each other um yes. as our you know fellow humans yeah, right. just playing in the sea that sense of it being a leveler and hmm. um and also that connection through nature is a great facilitator for helping people connect across all these other barriers we throw up you yeah know? right yeah. i love that yeah yeah you could, it's making me think about the sort of yeah what what an urban versions of that would look like mm. as well so it's yeah super yeah. interesting yeah so um we should talk about surfing a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I guess um, I wanted to wonder whether we could just talk about the lunar cycle. Yeah, um, amazing. Because um, that's a, like an unbelievable mm. film and project. And I'd just love to know, I'll link to it all and stuff, but cool. that came out sort of towards the end of last year, didn't it? It was released. But can you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so a lunar cycle kind of followed... Uh, a lunar cycle that I experienced <laughs> in winter last year. Um, and it was, Finisterre supported the filming of it with this amazing um, film director, Andrew Kandir, um, and um, a friend of mine who's also with Finisterre, Matt Smith, um, helped produce it. But essentially what it was, was a way to explore my connection with the sea in Ireland. Um, uh, yeah, through through the moon. So tapping into what the the impact of those more, I suppose, biological natural cycles on my experience as a woman who surfs in cold water. Mm. Um, and we wanted to, I suppose, I wanted to do that in a way that was 
um, it's a pretty creative piece. So oh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's like dancing, yeah. poetry, yeah. surfing in freezing water. I mean, it's it's, a, it's it's quite a it's quite something. Yeah, and it it just for me it was like how do you communicate visually in uh, in a way that what the what if, what I feel inside yeah. and for me it was also going well what how does my own the cycle within my own body respond to my natural environment and vice versa how does that impact me and where is because I'm also interested in, in our, our energy and um this kind of the, my <laughs> <laughs> I'm in I'm in this world in academia and then as a competitive surfer and it's just all push drive go 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 um and you're always on and that's the expectation and increasingly in how we work um but I've been feeling the last few years and exploring like what would it be like if we lived more in tune with these natural cycles as a woman you have the inbuilt one the menstrual cycle which is always taboo to talk about yeah. and yet learning how that could be a really powerful way if I tune into that to get the most out of the energy that I have and tap into when when that's in full flow, when it's more of an ebb and that's where it's I find a much more drawn to reflection and yeah. insight. And, yeah. Um and so uh, I'm then taking that into my surfing. And so that's what a, a lunar cycle is kind of exploring in a very abstract way. Um, and then the poetry element to it came from journaling I had been doing um throughout throughout that period as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of lines, the line, there's a few lines that struck out for me, but one, because I just feel I've been talking about this quite a lot recently, is was let, go, let go what wants to die, let emerge what wants to be born. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's lots tied up in that, but it's just that we've talked a bit about letting go and, and, and I keep finding myself having conversations a lot right now with mm. people about letting go of things. And um, yeah, so it's just, uh, yeah, yeah what's, what was... Can you give us any well, <laughs> insight into that? Even the process of doing it. So it was really trying to understand, um, I suppose, the interplay of masculine and feminine energy as well. That's, you know, we talk about ebb and flow, wax and wane of the moon. They're all sim symbolic of that. Um, yeah, and... Oh, where, where am I going? <laughs> 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 the letting go part. Yes. So even in the yeah. process of doing it, yeah. whenever we try to like push and go like, okay, there's this swell going um, we have to get on these waves. This, today's going to be the day. It just w never worked. And then whenever we were just totally like open to whatever possibility, had no real agenda, we're, oh, sure, we'll just go out anyways and see what happens. Or yeah. <laughs> it yeah. all flowed yeah. when we had let go of that need to try to get the shot yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, which I find even in the process of creating the film, it was really interesting to notice how those energies were working. Right. Um, and, and so there is so, I just came to value how much more power there is in letting go, but how hard <laughs> it can be. Yeah, right. Yeah. And do you find, because that's, uh, do you find when, because you've talked before about, you know, you've been observing the lunar cycle and your own cycle and all these other things to try and spot patterns and stuff. Mm. Um, do you find that, that, you know, that awareness or that consciousness that that you're trying to notice these patterns helps you in this process of letting go and completely yeah, yeah. i think since i've been doing it i I had this pattern uh, that I used to, I would ride pretty close to burnout when it got to the midway point of every year. Yeah. Um, or, you know, and sometimes actually on a few occasions burning out. Um, but this has really helped me almost by allowing it to be that sort of flux and flow. Um, that it's, everything has flowed a lot better. Um, when I, and also because I've been a less hard on myself. You know, when yeah. I've just not been feeling it. Yeah. And then I, I kind of tune into why that might be. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, that's because I'm not meant to be, yeah. um, you know, going for it right now. I actually need to be resting. And then honoring those spaces, the spaces in between, the spaces of feeling like doing nothing at all, that that valuing that instead yeah, of yeah, being right, like, right. That's, what's that's wrong with me? Time. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. failing. <laughs> yeah. What is that all about? Why have we got ourselves into um, that pickle? And that's know? still a challenge because you're, you have yeah. to, you know, show up in an everyday world that has a, a different sort of interpretation of how we use our yeah. time yeah. and put where we put our energy. What is um, value? But... Uh, Actually, I think I've just been when I am in in that space more in tune with cycles. I'm much more in in um, yeah in flow um, 
I don't get as sick as much, those kinds of things. And mm. I think there's such a richness there. And what excites me about it is that it's all available because it's with, within us. Right. Um, and I just haven't been aware of it. So bringing that kind of that level of consciousness to it is really exciting. And I feel like I'm only scratching the surface. So yeah. I want to explore that a lot more this year. Yeah. And I, th- I, I yeah, I love it. And I think it's, um, uh, you know, certainly something I'm, trying to practice more of is definitely the art of letting go and have been and again very similar having burnouts and breakdowns all over the place for the last years but but now but now you know now becoming much more aware of of those of what the patterns i guess that yeah. lead to those things and yeah and i do find i am finding it's not perfect and it's an ongoing practice and i don't get it right at all half the time but it's definitely um, regenerative it's definitely yeah. helping me deal with the onslaught or the complexity or the things that come my way it's helping me sort of figure out a bit more accurately now where to dial up my energy where to sort mm. of back off and step back and say it's probably not for me thank you anyway you know what I mean yep, even yep. saying no to things for me has been a massive problem <laughs> yeah it <laughs> really <laughs> helps with setting boundaries um, yeah, yeah, yeah. that are way more in tune yeah. with with your own energy um yeah and then it's also this how being in nature for me being in the ocean and water has really enhanced my own body literacy so we talk mm. about ocean literacy mm. and I think that's completely connected to our our body literacy I kind of like that yeah as a, as no well, exactly and I think that's the thing isn't it it's so you know we talk about this experiential learning and but I think it's this it's where it's where we're sort of finding ways t- to help ourselves and others merge this what what is learning what is knowledge mm. from this sort of heady yeah. thing you know of quite rational and solution driven and to something maybe which is more ongoing and <laughs> you know um embodied and yeah. you know you you sort of you are part of it. <laughs> You're exactly, not yeah. <laughs> and I feel I'm excited because I feel like we're on this journey from the head into a full-bodied way of knowing and yeah. learning and being. Yeah, amazing. I've got to get on a plane pretty soon. Just quickly, um, 2019, what what else have you got planned? Other things that we should be looking out for or just, yeah, anything? What's what's coming up for you? Yeah, we've, well, where to start, but in, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't want you to miss your flight. Uh, then, well, there... One of the next big things is the we have the wave maker retreat of happening course. again in Portugal. So it's exactly what we've been talking about of how to uh, take people who are in this, you know, high pressured leadership roles into a process that's all about experiential learning through nature. And we do that in in May, the tenth to the fourteenth of May. It's very uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who went past um, it. <laughs> and it's fun because I I love that creative element to it too, and it's a good antidote to my own for my own headspace. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm off to the Red School at the end of April to actually apprentice in uh, all this stuff that we've been talking about when it comes to cycles wow. and 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 the menstrual cycle and um, yeah there's a, there's a whole school on that wow <laughs> who knew so there we go yeah so, Amazing. as well as the sophie project and, and the oceans and human health research um so i actually see all these things connected <laughs> yeah 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 amazing well um i think i've asked you before but i'm gonna ask you again because it's something i ask everyone now which is um the on the spaceship earth you know there are no passengers on spaceship earth we're all crew what does that what does that mean to you right now that kind of idea yeah, I, well, it's a feeling I really got out of what we've just um, experienced here this last day of people coming from such, you know, diverse worlds and then just being really connected by this passion uh, for planet ocean, mm. <laughs> spaceship ocean, <laughs> um, and this feeling of of at all, even the process of what we did yesterday, how to move from these are our own individual priorities and what we think matters into this collective um, decision making process to come together to realize what it is that we want um, for a healthy ocean and healthy people, mm. healthy communities. Amazing, Eski. Thank you so much for this little chat and for and for inviting me over to this. Uh, this session in Dublin, it was uh, yeah. it was amazing to take part and um, really keen to see how it all unfolds. And yeah. good luck with 2019. And um, I'm sure we'll be uh, connecting again soon. Thank you. Yes. Right. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed listening to uh, that conversation with Eastgate Britain. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, always a treat to catch up with Eastgate. So do check out um, in the show notes 
her work and the project she's involved in and the films of Finisterre are really extraordinary. Um, and yeah, and um, let's get in the water more, more cold showers, more river swimming, more lakes, more jumping in the ocean and, uh, and uh, more, uh, more of that. Sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Um, as ever, do reach out um, if you want to chat or pop a question or a rant or whatever. Uh, I'm dan at thespaceship.earth. Um, I've got the new site live now, so um, thespaceship.earth. All the podcasts are there now. I've even got like a couple of cheeky merch t-shirts available from the wonderful T-Mill. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you fancy one of those or, you know, gifting it to someone, um, then please do that. I've got kids' teas as well. The new Earthling tea, which is my fave, um, uh, is there. Uh, and, yeah, and if you like what you're hearing, do, yeah, give us a rating. Uh, the reason I talk about that is because actually it really helps. The more ratings the show gets, the more the higher it sort of surfaces in people's searches and more people find the show. Uh, which would be nice, yeah, on Apple or I've got it on Spot on Spot Spodcast. Spot <laughs> on the Spaceship Earth or is a Spodcast. That sounds about right, actually. Um, Spotify. You can now find the Spaceship Earth on Spotify if you're if you're a Spotify if you're a Spotifyer. Um, yeah, or hit me up. I'm on Instagram at Dan Solos um, at Dan Solo on Twitter. Um, and yeah, take it easy out there. Remember, folks, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. Until next time, peace and out.